Oh, and this is Leslie Scanlon, um, and she's from Sydney Mechanics School of Arts. And uh, she's had a, a really successful career in terms of as a practitioner, as a researcher, and also as an author in higher education. And I believe she is currently writing a book on the early years of the Sydney Mechanics School of Arts and its cultural and educational uh, contributions to early Sydney. And um, she's also spearheads the Towards the 200th Anniversary Project for the um, Sydney um, School of Arts and has this really, really interesting um, interest in Henry Carmichael and his commitment to education in early settler society, New South Wales. Um, Carmichael's a really important uh, character figure in the history of Australia because of his work on secular national education, set up the first teachers training um, institution, and also really important in the accrediting system or fully accredit uh, accredited system of technical education in, in Australia. Um, Leslie Scanlon. Had you visited the Sydney Mechanics School of Arts sometime in the 1830s and the 1840s, and had some knowledge of mechanics institutes in Britain and in Scotland, I'm sure you would have felt rather at home. But had you engaged in conversation with the Reverend Slattery, one of the lecturers at the school, he would have said to you, be careful, don't make comparisons. The situation is vastly different and the usefulness of this institution cannot be circumscribed. Good evening, good morning, and happy birthday, Harriet Watt. I'm Leslie Scanlon, and I'm currently writing a book about the early years of the Sydney Mechanics School of Arts. And this evening, I would like to share with you just some of my initial thoughts in these first 17 years. When the school was founded in 1833, the Sydney Monitor commented that it had high hopes for the institution because it was in the hands of the Scots, who were, according to the Monitor, the most intellectual and tenacious race on earth. What were the expectations then and what were the agendas set for the school? These were multiple. They were enshrined in the Constitution. They were delivered in the introductory discourse by the Reverend uh, Henry Carmichael, one of the co-founders of the school. They were printed in the colonial press and they were harnessed to the agenda of effacing the shadow of the gallows. That is of turning the settlement from a convict settlement into a colony with responsible government. Well, how was it going to do this? Well, in line with mechanics institutes in Britain and Scotland, it was going to disseminate scientific and useful knowledge, and it was going to provide mechanics with the theory behind their practice. The press also expected that it would both educate and amuse all classes. And then the all important nation building. What challenges did the school face in trying to meet these multiple agendas? Well, the first challenge was in fact the society itself. Sydney was a very small town. It was a walkable town. It had a population when the school was founded of something like 30,000. By the late 1840s, it was no more than 45,000. And only a very, very small percentage, something like 2% were probably mechanics. Visitors described the settlement as wilderness. This was the most common descriptor that was used. And it was a descriptor, not only of the landscape, but of the society itself, and often of the morality of the members of that society. It was also described as excessively materialistic. I think it was actually aspirational. Many of the settlers in New South Wales and in Sydney in particular wanted obviously to improve their social situation. Free settlers did not travel 14,000 miles to have a worse situation than they had had at home. And I think it was here that the school had a very significant role to play in assisting those acquisitional members of society in gaining the tastes and the habits which would enable them to advance socially. In other words, that it would provide them with the cultural capital that they lacked. Okay, so who were the members? This was a challenge. 
Did the mechanics flock to the Sydney Mechanics School of Arts as they as they did in some mechanics institutes at home? Or were there problems in attracting mechanics? Well, as early as 1835 and 1836, the committee commented that there was a paucity of that class of person for whom the school had been established, namely that mechanics didn't flock to the Sydney Mechanics School of Arts. Numbers are very, very difficult to ascertain, but certainly by the end of the 1840s, there were no more than 20 mechanics registered. Why was this, why was this so? What happened to the mechanics? Why didn't they come to the school? Well, one of the reasons, and a reason which was mentioned uh, frequently by the committee, was the fluctuating economic situation in the colony. In good times, frankly, the mechanics were too busy. They worked 12 hour days, the lectures finished at 9.30 at night, and the colonial press uh, said to the committee, look, unless you can finish earlier than that, they're not going to come. What about bad times? When the depression hit in the early 40s, the 12 shilling um, fee for, for a year was simply far beyond most mechanics. Moreover, why would you come to lectures at the Sydney Mechanics School of Arts? You'd be sitting for two hours, you would be hearing an array of lectures, often uh, sprinkled with Latin phrases. Were you going to be any more employable as a result of coming to these lectures than if you didn't go? What about the lecture program? Did the lecture program actually attract mechanics? There were, you know, looking at all of the lectures from 1833 to 1850, none of the lectures were of immediate applicable practice. The main industries were breweries, there were flour mills, and there were tanneries. And yet not one of the lectures would have made the mechanics in those industries any more work ready. There was also a certain blandness about the lecture program. And again, this has been mentioned in le the lecture programs often in Britain as well. Like the mechanics movement in general, controversial topics were banned. Now, there were issues in the colony which, which directly affected the mechanics and the, me and the welfare of mechanics. And perhaps if they had been uh, able to debate these, perhaps if they had had lectures on these, they might have come. One of the most significant of, the, of these issues was immigration. There was much dissatisfaction in the colony with the colonial office emigration policies. For example, at the height of the depression, in some weeks, there were up to 1000 immigrants arriving in Sydney when you have high levels of unemployment, particularly uh, uh, in the me mechanic class. There were offers of lectures on emigration and the committee refused, thinking that it was far too divisive. There were also wishes, for example, the secular education system in which Henry Carmichael was the chief spokesman. The school never ever mentioned it. There were also alternative entertainments. You could go to the theater, you could go to the circus. Perhaps more enticingly, you could go to taverns or less salubrious grog shops. Well, the fact that these were incredibly popular is indicated that in 1841, there were 7,000 arrests in Sydney, and of these, 60% were for drunkenness. So who did come? Well, they were clerks, they were shopmen, they were the so-called black-coated workers, and of course, the so-called gentlemen. From the very beginning, there was this middle class element. It was run by the middle class and the majority of the members were also middle class. So who lectured at this school? You have a very small population. And Henry Carmichael admitted that really there were not many men of exalted intelligence uh, in the settlement. And it's been estimated that probably something like 700 men could write with assistance a paper and perhaps deliver a lecture. That's if they were A, wanted to do so, and B, were prepared to do it for nothing. So who did deliver lectures? Well, they've been called the colonial literati. They were teachers, they were clergymen, doctors, lawyers, administrators. Then there were the explorers like Leichhardt, who re reported, uh, and Thomas Mitchell, who reported uh, on their journeys. There were visiting scientists and there were visiting scholars. All of these men were amateurs. 
And I think we have to ask, were these the most appropriate individuals to be lecturing to mechanics? The odd mechanic, of course, did lecture and the school from time to time put out calls for mechanics to come and share their skills. Well, when part of this uh, period that I'm looking at was in deep depression, it is highly unlikely that uh, an unemployed mechanic would give a lecture for nothing uh, and upskill other mechanics who would be obvious competitors for whatever few jobs were available. All right, what sort of lectures were held at the school? Well, there were three kinds. First of all, there were the introductory lectures, and these were held at the beginning of every season. And initially, the Reverend Henry Carmichael delivered most of those. In each of these lectures, two things were talked about constantly, and they were the advantages of coming to the Sydney Mechanics School of Arts and the advantage of education more generally. There were two other kinds of lectures, and the first of these were what we, I suppose we could classify as scientific lectures. These were lectures that dealt in codified systematic knowledge. About 70% of the lectures were like this. There was a lectures on astronomy and hydraulics and steam and electricity, galvanism. And if you had read Mary Shelley, they must have been particularly interesting. And these compare quite favourably with the lectures that were held in British institutions. Um, but these were not directly applicable to the work of mechanics. They did provide theoretical knowledge and they did reinforce the notion that the 19th century was a century of progress and that the colony was actually part of it. Now, the committee continually had to apologise for being unable to provide a full set of scientific lectures because it lacked the chemicals and the equipment to do so, the so-called philosophical apparatus, which had to be uh, bought from England. It was very expensive uh, and it had to survive a very dangerous sea route. And, and many of these shipments were locked at sea. Uh, Mr. Lees, for example, of the Edinburgh School uh, did assist in uh, acquiring a number um, of instruments for the school, but these were lost, lost off Cape Town. It was also useful knowledge. Uh, this is that very elusive 19th century term. What was useful knowledge? Well, according to Henry Carmichael, it was knowledge that led to social happiness and general usefulness. Now, it might include the flowery fields of literature, for example. So it might be lectures on Shakespeare, Burns, history, and so on. Or it might be about taste, the vulgarities of speech. And these lectures were actually designed to steer members away from the low and the vulgar, for example, from reading books, uh, novels about jo uh, Jack Shepard. But they were also about the presentation of self. They were about, again, cultural capital. And to help those people uh, who were upwardly mobile or who wanted to be upwardly mobile to acquire the accoutrements required uh, for society. So did the school actually meet expectations? Within the time limit, I think, and within the constraints, I think it began to do so. So yes, I think if you did visit the school in the 1830s and the 1840s, it would have seemed quite familiar. But beneath all this familiarity, there were significant differences. The Sydney Mechanics School of Arts was a highly complex organisation and it was striving to meet multiple agendas that ranged from the education of mechanics to assistance in nation building, of moving a convict settlement along the road to responsible government. I think over the time, 188 years, the Sydney Mechanics School of Arts has adapted and adjusted to changing times, and I think its longevity is an indication of its overall success. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, again, a really, really rich presentation. Um, there's just one comment in the chat and um, from Patrick Corbett, which I will then um, make and I, I will then follow it up with a question myself related to what Patrick is saying. Patrick says, isn't it interesting how the mechanics institutes seem to have involved, evolved into the not for mechanics institutes? Also, how the social issues 
issues that came up for discussion, explain why Trade Union Congress was set up at Manchester Mechanics Institute in 1866. And I think this is the question. I don't know if you can turn. Yeah, there you are, Leslie. Thank you. Um, and this is the... I, I invite you, Leslie, to, to comment or reflect on that. But linked to that, it was really um, linked to you know, the thing that this is a not for Mechanics Institute. I guess my question is, is that why didn't they then convert it into a um, something that was more appealing? You said that your know, 12 shillings a year is far too expensive. You can get much um, cheaper and more pleasurable um, entertainment elsewhere. So why didn't they reduce the price? You sort of implied in your in your talk that the reason is that um, this was about upskilling and mechanics didn't want to give away, if you like, their social and economic capital. But you know, we do see in other mechanics institutes that it's not only about upskilling. In fact, that might be actually quite a minor um, aspect of the the institutions. So can you just? Tell us a little bit more about why not for mechanics and what that um, tells us about the politics of these institutions. Uh, thank you, Joanne. Thank you very much for the question. I think a lot of it has to do with the committee men of the time and the settlement of the time. Henry Carmichael desperately tried to introduce technical education for mechanics. And he attempted in 1844 to copy from the Edinburgh School and to introduce a fully certified technical education. It went before the committee and the committee men said, as they often did, sorry, put it on the back burner, wait till we've got bigger premises and nothing happened. And it really was not until 1871, well outside my period, that we really had the beginning of the working men's college and adapting to perhaps working class educational needs. But I also think that the Mechanics Institute was part of the imperial movement. And of course, in the post-colonial world, this is not seen as a particularly good thing to have been. But I think the notion of moving from convict settlement to representative government, I think the committee men of the time viewed the situation as requiring a certain degree of polish. And this is why we have some of the lectures that we did. The interesting lectures, for example, from Rennie about vulgarities of speech certainly were there to train young men, as were the mutual instruction classes, as was the debating society, which interestingly split in 1841 because it couldn't uh, talk about controversial matters. And I don't think from the very beginning they had that same sense of urgency being in a non-industrial society that perhaps other mechanics institutes did. It was more about, I guess, that enlightenment notion of improvement through education and the, the moral notion of education. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was a really lovely answer to, to what is a very complex question. Just in the, cat, in the chat, uh, Kerry, uh, Carly says that she had a great... Um, aunt who studied sculpture with the Sydney Mechanics and was and one of her sculptures was featured in the Institute's magazines. Thanks very much oh. for that, that Kerry. We've actually run out of time, unfortunately. I mean, I think this, if we had more time, I think it'd be really wonderful. And if we were in the same room for the three of you to um, yes, reflect yes. on this comparative aspect, because this is yes. a really interesting thing, Scotland, England and, and Australia. But that I think is gonna be for another time, but we will be coming back to some of the things that were discussed in these first three papers in discussions later on in the conference. So thank you so much. Patrick O'Farrell, John Gardner, and Leslie Scanlon. 